there'll be questions at the end, but I mean, it's up to you whether you want to be... Yeah, no, it's just conscious we're running a bit late, so it's um, playing havoc with my scheduled tweets um, in terms of doing it. Actually, that, that blog post was a result of this conference and this presentation because um, a year ago, um, I hadn't actually started at GISC and Sarah Davies was presenting about this project and where it was and where we were expecting it to go. And I've basically been using that presentation for the last 12 months and <laughs> we decided we couldn't use it again. So no depressed Dave today. Um, but you may remember the pyramid. And it's, we did think about doing something new and I thought actually if you compare this to last year's pyramid, it is slightly different. We've still got at the heart the digital capability framework and I'll come on to that in a minute. But at the t and we also had talked about leadership development and since then we've run a pilot. I'll also talk about that. But the top pyramid at the time last year, we called it a diagnostic tool because obviously there is something wrong with you if you don't have digital capabilities and we need to fix you. And we realised that wasn't the message that we wanted to give people. So we decided to reflect on that and the name we came up with is the discovery tool to allow individual members of staff to discover more about their digital capability. The bottom right there, the online offer, was very much about called online courses and MOOCs and then we started to realise that with six elements of digital capability, 13 sub-elements, whether you work in HE, FE and skills, whether you're a member of staff, a manager, a senior manager, whether you, which academic department you work in, whether you work in business support and learner support, we worked it out you need about 4,096 different MOOCs and who was going to run all those. So we decided to do something different and I'll talk about that as well. So last year we published the framework which I think happened just after the conference in terms of doing it and one of the things that we noticed when we just pushed it out there was how quickly it resonated with people like you and in the sector suddenly this diagram and by the way this is a slightly different one just purely for presentation purposes so you can read it in terms of it hasn't changed just stretched it a bit but it was really working in terms of people looking at it they were saying actually this is something we can work with and I think there is something very important about having some kind of standard framework that we can all relate to, that we can always map to, to apply lenses to, to share, to tag, to enable us to be able to then do things across the sector. We also um, published some pro example profiles of the sort of digital skills required for different roles. Um, and I've actually tweeted out the links to these so you can go to the GISC repository and download them. But it was very much about saying to people, these are examples, go and do your own. So we know that there are universities out there and colleges who are building the same, here is our example lecturer profile for the University of, let's say, Ambridge, for example. And here are the skills that you need for these different capabilities. So that's one of the key things. By having a consistent framework, we can write and share profiles that, that allow us to be able to identify, you know, what are the skills required, what are the competencies required at the different levels. So to kind of, I'm not going to read all this and you don't need to read it in terms of doing it because it's in the profile, but just to give you an idea about what we talk about. So we're talking about digital collaboration. It is about using things like shared digital tools, being able to work effectively across different kinds of boundaries. When we talk about um, digital innovation for researchers in terms of doing it, again, just putting some outlines in terms of doing it. This isn't saying this is the right way of doing it or the wrong way of doing it. It's an example. So... Let's start talking about the tools in terms of doing it. So last year we talked about, said we are going to build a tool. So what we've actually done within GISC is we've built a tool that allows us to build tools so we can build a suite of tools that are then sustainable and keep us great things in terms of doing it. <laughs> but really the key here is does the discovery tool help individual members of staff to think about their own capability and build on it. So what we've done is we've got a tool that provides a series of questions and one of the interesting things that's coming out of the pilots is the kind of completion rate. People are answering all the questions in terms of doing it and they're discovering aspects of their digital capability and they get a nice little kind of diagram that reflects where they are. So we talk, remember we've talk, spoken in the past about spiky profiles in terms of doing it. It then provides them with feedback that makes them reflect and think about where they are, where they could be, and where they might want to go. And it was really interesting. When we first did this tool, and myself and Sarah Davies, we went through it, we did it, and actually I started to discover something about myself. This isn't my profile, but one of the things I did was I had high level of capability and ICT proficiency. 
I kind of guess that. I'm a bit of a geek. I know these things. I had low levels of capability in digital research. Yeah, I can handle that. I've spent 25 years in FE. We don't do that kind of thing. But what was interesting was in terms of promotion, I had low capability. And it made me think. I thought, no, I'm on Twitter. I tell everyone about. And then I realised it clicked. I was promoting myself, but I wasn't promoting others. I changed my behaviour. I started thinking about how could I share what my colleagues are doing, what my peers are doing, what other people are doing, and started thinking much more differently about engaging and networking with different people. So even someone like myself who's really immersed in this found about something about myself that I didn't know. So, I think one of the key things is, and by the way, just to kind of put this in perspective, the tool is out for a kind of closed beta at the moment, but this is where I kind of feel I should be wearing um, I should a polo neck and go, I'm pleased to announce that this tool will be available for you from the summer. So this is, so in terms of doing it, so it'll be a full public beta in the summer for everybody to be able to join in. And the way that the tool works is there is a series of questions related to the different capabilities. And you kind of, as you can see here, I'm interested in learning about new devices or applications. What this is, is not about testing competencies. It's not about testing skills. It's about discovering where you are, the sort of person you are in terms of digital capability, and what that means, and therefore what you can do differently. But of course, one of the things that we wanted to do with this tool is not just about the individuals, it's also about aggregating the data. So covering, looking at all your staff digital capabilities and start thinking about what are the implications. And I'm just going to pick on one question here. I'm interested in learning about new devices or applications. Who here agrees with that for themselves? Let's just put up your... Okay, who disagrees? Now, what does that tell me? Imagine you with my staff. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me that if I get to introduce a new tool, that you're probably more likely to adopt it and be encouraged to try it out. But if we reverse that, and you're all going, no, I don't like doing that. I like sticking with what I've always done in terms of doing it. It means that I say, here, great, go and do Wordle. Go and do Padlet. Go and, do, and you're all going, oh, and that's what happens. But if you know that, that your staff have low capabilities in those kinds of areas, then you need to really rethink the way that you're going to do training and development in order to build that capability. Don't expect if you say, go do Padlet, that they will, if they have a low capability in that area. And we can look at that across all those areas of digital capability. So, where are we at with this in terms of doing it? Just kind of give you some insight in terms of doing it. We've done some large-scale tests across whole institutions. And that's been really interesting because what it has done, one of the things we said, would this work? And one of the things that we have found is that the picture that the aggregator describes reflects the perception of that university or college. And that's been really interesting. In other words, people are answering the questions in a way that is both honest because the tool is non-threatening. We've also doing some small-scale pilots to look at cohorts and to kind of help them out. We've also, as part of the Digital Capability User Group, provided that out, and people are doing that with small-scale tests with small groups and so on. So what we're doing is we're taking all that feedback, we're doing some user groups, some focus groups, doing some more stuff, bringing it all in, and we're going to just go back through the tool and reflect about how does this work, what can we do to improve it, where are the questions, looking at all the data, so that we can provide the sector with a tool that helps individual members of staff understand where they are in terms of digital capability and build it. And as I said, be launched as a full public beta in the summer. Another part of the pyramid was the digital leadership program. And really where this is at, we did a pilot in the autumn which was extremely successful. And what was really interesting was to see people who attended that program go away and actually start to do things differently in their institution. It was helping them become more effective digital leaders. It was helping them to do different things in terms of their organisations and thinking about their strategy. Let me ask you a question. Barclays Bank is the oldest bank, one of very old, it's older than the Bank of England, it's not the oldest bank, it's one of the oldest banks, but it's older than the Bank of England. It's been around since about 1600-ish in terms of doing it. Where is their biggest branch? Is it Oxford Street? 
Some, I can see Phil and Kerry going, we know this. <laughs> In terms of, is it Oxford Street? Is it Birmingham? No. As you're probably more than aware, it's this. It's their app. The biggest branch of Barclays is their app. More people engage with their app on a day-to-day -day basis than actually all the other branches combined. What does that mean? It means that the senior management at Barclays, the middle management at Barclays, and everybody else in Barclays needs to be digitally capable and digitally aware. It's not something to say, well, that's not for us to do, that's for somebody else to do. No, it's part and parcel of what you need to do. If you want to be a modern organisation that helps build capability, you know, that is a digital organisation, you need to be aware of this. And that's what the Digital Leadership Programme is about. It's about helping and supporting the leaders of higher education and colleges to become more effective digital leaders. So, this will be running in October as a full part of the JISC um, offer in terms of doing it. So that will start to be advertised in the next month or so. So do look out for that. This is something about sending your deputy vice chancellors on, your deans and so on. It's very much aimed at that kind of level. Your college principals, your vice principals and your assistant principals. So you go through the discovery tool. You work out where you are in terms of digital capability. You've got some feedback, but you want to do a bit more. And one of the things that we are working on is providing an online offer. We call it an online offer. So b the best way of describing it is a playlist of activities, resources, content and guides that is appropriate to you as an individual and your level of digital capability for each of the six elements of digital capability. That is suddenly becomes really exciting because what it means is that... Everyone here got iTunes? Anyone got iTunes? Playlists? Yeah? No, yeah? Spotify? Playlists? Amazon Prime? 80s rock concerts? There we go. Hit it. In terms of, isn't it? People understand playlists. It is about creating a list of content. And you can have different kinds of playlists. So you can have playlists which are dynamic. In other words, as new content is created and tagged, it automatically gets added to the playlist. So you see the most current things. You can make playlists saying, show me the 10 most popular resources about digital communication. You could also create static playlists. Here is the Gillian Fielding playlist of digital capability resources to do with this. This is her favourite things. We can start to share those, show them on Twitter. Here is the Sarah Knight digital student playlist. Here's the James Clay best places to go and get coffee plate. No, no, that probably wouldn't be there in terms of doing it. But what's really exciting about this is this isn't just about linking to just content. This is about linking to all content out there that helps people build digital capability. And that to me is really important. It's about saying where is the best thing. In order for that to happen, we need to be able to tag it and put it against the framework. And that's why having a you know, standard framework across the sector to me makes so much more sense. I want to find out more about digital communication. Well, uh, University of Ambridge has some great resources on that. I want to use those ones. Coal Hill Technical College has something that's even better on digital collaboration and is starting to build those things. And I really like the GIST guide on cloud computing. So a lot of this will be based around the up and coming JISC app and content store, which third parties will be able to upload to in terms of doing it. So it'll all be kind of linked, it'll be ranked, it'll be a whole range of different things. So do have a look out for that, um, which will be coming out in the next few months as well. So what do we understand by digital capability? I, normally if I'm doing this, recycling my keynotes, I ask this question. And you'll be surprised. I'm not going to ask you because I'm hoping. Actually, tweet it out. Digital capability is. Okay? And let's see what, let's, I can read that later. But it is a question. What do we understand by digital capability? And I'm tempted to take out a microphone and ask the audience. But uh, let's ask Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> Oh okay, I'll shout into this mic. Yeah, I'll Okay, I'd say it's the, um, the skills and the practices that we need um, to thrive in our learning environments, our working environments, our teaching environments, and our play environment. So, what we need to be able to just be confident and, and comfortable online. Okay, let me just stay there, don't go. If I went to your university, yeah, and walked 10 metres down the, 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 the corridor, mm -hmm. down a floor, up or down and went to another room and knocked on the door, would they give you the same answer? Would, they, would the member of staff in their office give the same answer? No. no. <laughs> and actually, I think this is one of the real challenges. What does your staff understand by digital capability? I was at a conference for careers advisors. I asked them this question. They came to the conclusion that digital capability was the ability to be able to use Twitter and LinkedIn. 
in terms of, that was it, that was it. Like, you can use Twitter and LinkedIn. That's digital capability, because that was on their radar. So one of the key things I always say is if you are thinking about building capability within your institutions, which you must be because you're here, is think about that shared understanding. What does it mean? What do other people assume it means? Some people think it's about training for Word. People think it's about training for um, using tools like Word and, sorry, Wordle and Padlet and all these kinds of things. So it is really kind of critical to kind of get that shared understanding. You're the one if you're not on Twitter. And if you aren't there already, you've missed it. If you haven't been bookmarked, retweeted, and blocked, you might as well not have existed. You might as well not have existed. So. Twitter, you've all said you're all on Twitter, aren't you, in terms of doing it, in terms of doing it. Um, I'm not going to ask those questions. Since. Let's go back. This is 26th of March, 2007, 9.20 a.m. This is my first ever tweet. What a t I, I think a lot of people who work in this field probably have something similar to like this in terms of doing it. And it's one of those things, like, why on earth am I using this? What is this tool about? What can I get out of it? To be honest, most of the time I just wrote things like this. <laughs> I think a lot of us don't. You know. um, so that's the next day. <laughs> and it was one of those things. You know, it's like, why are you, t why are you t tweeting about coffee? Well, it's normally like, I'm going to learn how to use this tool. The best way of doing it is to use it. Fine. Right, I've done some work. Go for a coffee break. Sit down. Or before I start my real work, I better do this Twitter thing. What am I doing? Oh, drinking coffee <laughs> in terms of doing it. But actually, there is something about this, isn't it, in terms of moving along. How do you know how to do Twitter? Who here has attended a class on how to do Twitter? But you're all using Twitter. We all know how to use it. And actually, after nearly nine years of using Twitter, actually over nine years of using Twitter, I kind of think, thought about, I use it very differently today than I did nine years ago. It's really useful. Download your Twitter archive and go back in time and have a look. And I'm seeing the really weird things of what I've done. But actually, you often hear people say, go do Twitter. It's the best CPD ever. And you're thinking, no, it's really hard to be able to do that. But there's also, how many people here work in an institution where everybody in that institution is on Twitter and using it effectively? No, I didn't think so. I mean, why would that happen in terms of doing it? It's not about Twitter. But actually, this is really, I think, interesting in terms of digital communication. Because I use Twitter, and one of the reasons I got Twitter and was an early user of Twitter was because I used something called Usenet. Anyone here use Usenet? A few, a few people are like, oh dear, you're not doing it now. You know. But actually, because I use Twitter, okay, it means that when I'm introduced to a new tool, I'm probably more likely to make use of it because I understand it. I understand about digital communication. I understand about communicating online. I understand about sharing, collaboration, communicating, engaging. If I don't do Twitter and someone says, go do Yammer, because that's now the enterprise environment conversation tool that we're going to have across our university, don't be surprised that those kinds of people don't engage with it because they can't do that transfer. If you then say, if people who don't do Twitter say, hello, here is your new VLE. It's got some great communication tools. Fine, I'm just going to upload all my PowerPoints to it because that's all I know how to do. And to me, this is why capabilities is really important. This isn't about saying, go do Twitter, but it's understanding it that if you've got a lot of staff who don't engage with social media and Twitter, they're going to have a really hard time struggling to understand the benefits of the communication tools within a VLE or something like Yammer. Who's this? Obviously, none of you follow me on Twitter. Now, <laughs> in terms of doing it. But um, here's a story from September 2015, and because my scheduled tweets are now gone past, everyone knows what this is about <laughs> in terms of doing it. But in September 2015, um, a member of staff at an HIV clinic was asked by her manager to send out a newsletter to 780 people. So what did she do? She composed an email, put all 780 emails in the to field, saying, here's your HIV newsletter, because you visited our, our clinic. It's like, yes, breach but of a whole range of things. And what did the manager say? It was down to human error. Okay? They've just been fined £180,000. Okay? This wasn't human error. This is digital capability. 
That member of staff did not have the capability to understand, through in terms of ICT proficiency and digital communication, what were appropriate tools to use for sharing information and sending out newsletters. She didn't have the digital capability in terms of data literacy to understand the importance of protecting personal information. There was a lack of leadership within there because people weren't providing her with the right tools. There was an assumption that she had the skills and the, start, the skills to be able to do this. She didn't. As a result, mistakes were made. This wasn't human error. This was all about digital capability. Name that boat. <laughs> It doesn't matter it's called RSS so of David Attenborough, it's always going to be Boaty McBoatface. And why is that such an issue? This is all about digital participation. If you now ask the internet to name something, what's it going to be called? Kerry, who's in my group, Group F, has already said, should we call our IT director IT Mac IT Face or something <laughs> or those kind of things? It's there already, you know. The US Air Force have asked people to name their new bomber. Bomber Mac Bomb Face has become where we are. It's one of those things. No matter what you call it. So I was very disappointed. I, I live in Western Supermare. Okay, you, you can commiserate me with me later. I live in Western Supermare and we're just going to build a new kind of leisure centre, uh, stroke uh, entertainment centre. And they've asked us to name it. I was thinking, great, here we go. And it's like, choose from the following list of names. Oh, how boring <laughs> in terms of doing it. But actually, this is, again, digital capability. This is about digital participation. They should have recognised this from a very early stage. Maybe it was their intention. But if you ask the internet to do something, and if you've seen the Photoshop stuff where people say, fix my photograph and all those kinds, don't ask the internet in terms of things. Give them a choice. Get that kind of engagement. But don't ask them to name something. Another kind of aspect in terms of digital capabilities, there's been some, you know, people want to be able to work from home, people want to be able to work anywhere, location independent working, ability to be able to do what you need to be able to do. But of course, often there's an assumption that people have the digital capabilities and the skills to be able to do this effectively. It's like, yeah, I can work from home because I've got email. But why aren't they thinking about using those kind of other kind of tools like Skype for Business? Why aren't they thinking about um, Google Docs? SharePoint and so on. And actually, if you want to change things, you know, make things more effective in terms of things like location independent working, then there really is a whole aspect of digital capabilities that needs to be thought through. And it also needs to be thought through in terms of all those other systems and support processes that you have within your organisation. Let's lock everything down because we're going to assume that everyone is on campus. But of course, if they're not on campus, how can they get through to corporate systems? And it makes a big difference. And I've just been thinking about that game with our IT director who probably assumed that everybody would be on site and have a lockdown standardised approach. Here we are 16 years later. We have BYOD. We have ubiquitous Wi-Fi. I'm, you know, to people talking here about how bad the Wi-Fi is, I'm thinking I'm getting 50 meg download on my 4G really fast. So that's kind of where we are in terms of what we've been talking about. But one of the things that we are now thinking seriously about is institutional digital capability. There's much more about digital capability than just the sum of the individual staff capabilities. And it really, that effective use of technology by university and college staff uh, providing that compelling student experience, we think about our three kind of core functions that most of us have, teaching and learning, research and engagement. And those are very much dependent on you know, having a good infrastructure, ubiquitous Wi-Fi, having an organisation that actually allows that cross-sector working, cross-department working, training that actually recognises where people are at an individual, the ability to use data, data bringing in kind of analytics, the ability to have the right equipment, resources, hardware and software as and when needed and maybe having some kind of intelligent campus that allows people to use those, those aspects more effectively and providing staff and learners with appropriate content. When you start to look at those, you realise, of course, you've got your cylinders of excellence. Sorry, silos. I mean, departments in terms of doing it. And things is, you know, you have people who have got great IT services but it doesn't elsewhere. And when you start to think about it, Digital capability isn't just dependent on skill, staff skills. It's an absolute critical part. But it's also about these departments having digital capability and the staff working with them having digital capability. 
you know, if we to pick on one of these, infrastructure, for example, ubiquitous Wi-Fi, edgy roam, so that you can go anywhere, access to hardware, virtual desktops so you can work anywhere, access to collaborative tools, remote working, room utilization, innovation. How do you, how do you manage innovation? in terms of doing it, you know, if that's kind of key things. Everything about people services, you know, just do what I do. Go to jobs.ac.uk and just download a load of job descriptions for the word lecturer and see how many have the word digital in it or even technology. So I did that recently, two job descriptions. One didn't mention digital and technology at all. The other one did mention technology, but that's because it was a lecturer in nuclear technology but it didn't mention anything else. Well, we saw one once that said a willingness to use the VLE. So can you imagine the interview? Hello, welcome to the University of Ambridge. Are you willing to use the VLE? Yes. Are you going to use it? No. You know, <laughs> it's not very much about that. Skills analysis and audit, where are those skills? Where are those gaps in terms of doing it? So, another aspect, which I kind of mentioned here, digital learning, the VLE. If you think about the VLE, people think, oh, we're going to introduce a new VLE, we need to focus on digital learning and development. That's what it is. It's all about learning, learning, learning. Actually, it's a bit more than that, isn't it? A proper VLE is also about communication, collaboration, all these aspects. And actually, there's an assumption there that you have a proficiency in ICT that enable you to take advantages. Who here who signed up for the, um, the game and the, the link site has uploaded their own photograph to the um, things? You know, that's a level of ICT proficiency that people sometimes don't have. Let's throw in analytics now in terms of doing it. Data literacies, information literacies. You know, let's start then, you start to think. So if you think about next generation VLEs, which the VLE will now start understanding where a learner is and where they've been, as well as what they've got to do. So one of the things that we'll be building over the next 12 months, where is digital capability going after we've launched the kind of individual tool, is providing institutions, or potentially, with a dashboard. Tell them how fast they're going and where they are. Helping them to build digital capability, not just at an individual level and getting that aggregation, but also about building institutional digital capability. What do I need to do to make my institution more digital capable? So we're building a prototype, helping people to link in with resources and services where we need to go. It's a very early days. You're the first people to hear about this in terms of doing it. So it's about you know, pr pr appropriate tools, about services, advice and guidance and so on. But of course, Rome wasn't built in a day to use an overused cliche, just because I like the picture <laughs> in terms of doing it. So just to kind of summarise, digital capability is core to the core functions of a modern university and college. But it is dependent on all these kind of aspects of infrastructure, data and resources. You know, what are those domains, are those functions of those organisations? Who within those domains needs to understand the digital and the impact that has on the organisation? So what should we do? And one of the key things is that, again, coming back to the individual, staff digital capabilities, leadership development. And as you know, this is, you know, our, what we're doing in the moment is focusing on staff digital knowledge and skills. It is about identifying the digital skills needed, the skills gaps, and planning and implementing evaluation initiatives to improve skills. This is a slide from Sarah's presentation last year, and it's still something that's kind of our mantra in terms of where we're at. And to me, this is important. What is interesting is how a lot of people I've spoken to said, what about student digital skills in terms of doing it and helping students build their digital capability? And actually often the, the tool that we've got in theory could be used by that, but it's something we are seriously looking at. The key is, is that next stage, what resources can we offer them? And to me, there's probably a lot of those resources already out there in terms of helping build student capability. Just that one on staff development, and I could pick on Phil here. Phil, <laughs> <laughs> what don't you know that you don't know? <laughs> or don't you know what you don't know in terms of doing it? And what I mean by the whole Donald Rumsfeld model of staff development, if you don't know what you don't know, how do you know that you need to know it in terms of doing it? And it is things. And people sometimes assume that they've got this high, how good are you at using Word, for example? I'm very good at using Word. Do you use styles? What are styles? You know, it's not there in terms of doing it. So there's often an assumption that people have these basic levels of digital capabilities, that people know how to use email effectively, 
People know how to use a range of digital communities, but, but do they? How would you know? How do they know they know? Who knows? So, I'm not sure why I put that slide in there, but there we go. <laughs> okay. So kind of summarise really, very much about you know, looking at digital capability of not just the individual, but also the organisation. Helping organisations build digital capabilities of their staff through effective staff development and training and resources and activities, but also helping organisations become more digitally capable by thinking and making them to think about how their structures, their organisation and their infrastructure. So, at that point, are there any questions? But before we just go there, just start reflecting on what questions do I want to ask him. If you want to find out more about the project, all these links have been tweeted out under James Clay, at James Clay. So you can go to the main website, you can follow the project on the blog, or you can just follow us on the Twitter using hashtags. So let's go for some questions. Because I think I've got about five minutes. Is that right? Well, but it was slightly overrunning. But, but yeah, I did try and <laughs> cram it in. <laughs> oh, go on there, Fiona. I've got a question, and it was about your... It was, it was about this digital leadership program for senior people. Is that a face-to-face -face program? Yes, it's uh, two sets of two days. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, kind of two days to find out a bit more about yourself and then two days to think about how you're going to improve your organisation. So that's a big um, commitment. A big commitment. It's four people. days for senior managers. Yeah. The, the, the feedback that we had from the senior managers who attended it yeah. was this is absolutely critical right. and essential okay. in terms of doing it. So we're not aiming it at like man tell managers or those guys, yeah. this is aimed at senior management. Because the Changing the Learning Landscape uh, program, if you engage with that, then the idea was that your very senior people were invited to go to a course and that course we never persuaded out, you know, the right people to get, yeah. to get there. And I wonder if you're going to have the same challenge. I think we will have the same challenge and I think that's what it's about. But what, the, the reason why we were a bit more, were quite confident was the senior managers who've been on that program already as part of the pilot have gone away and said, we, now, we, want, we want more of it, we need to send our other managers on it Great. in terms of doing it. So we're quite, feeling quite confident yeah. and positive about that. There's two over there. Are you going to? Brilliant. Cheers. Then. Thanks. Um, the digital discovery tool that you talked about earlier, earlier on for staff, can students use it? Is there plans for students to use one in the future? We are, the, the, the issue here is with the feedback. So the feedback is very much aimed at staff, but it doesn't mean that... What we, one of the reasons we're building a tool that builds tools is to enable us to very easily duplicate and replicate stuff. But one of the key things is what feedback do we give learners and what's the, because if you say, for example, you're digital, you've got low capability in digital learning, this is how you engage with learners on the VLE. It's not really going to help learners. There's a, there's a different aspect, and it's the feedback and the resources that are kind of critical to that. But what we don't think is the development time is going to be that long in terms of doing it. But there is, the, 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 it's, it's one of those things that there is a demand for. So we are looking about how we can do that. And there was a question at the back. Um, I have a terrible admission, which is I don't tweet. I'm not interested in tweeting. I am a program manager. I enable change. I get the importance of it, of tweeting and social media, especially in our implementation of a groundbreaking VLE. Does it matter that I don't tweet? No. This isn't about saying if, you've, if people aren't tweeting, they've got to go and do Twitter. It isn't about that. What it's saying is if people aren't using tools like Twitter, they're going to st and they're only using tools like email, when you then introduce a tool that has similarities to Twitter, in the fact of you've got to up to communicate online through a discussion forum, they're going to struggle because they can't make that jump. They're going, I don't want to go to a website, I want it as email in terms of doing it. So this isn't about saying, oh, you've got to go and do Twitter, but it's understanding that if staff are not using Twitter and then you expect them to start using those communication tools effectively within your groundbreaking VLE or an uh, enterprise network like Yammer, they're going to struggle because they won't understand the value of it, why they would need to do it, because it's not what they're used to in terms of doing it. So your training needs to reflect that. If you've got staff who are highly capable and are using a wide range of social media, they'll get it. And the transfer, your hardest bit would say, well, I don't want you to use that, I want you to use this. And that's a different sort of training. So you can see there's two different types of training. But it's dependent on knowing where your staff are at. So don't go and do Twitter. It's not about doing Twitter. 
in terms of doing it. It's about understanding digital communication, what it means, the best way of using it, the different tools that are available, the potential of those different tools, and what's the right tool to use in that right context for your organisation and your individual.